Dr Brinda Shivalingam from RPA Hospital in Sydney. Tonight's Australian story is about a special patient of mine. He's David Murrell, and his story centres on a lucky but unlikely family coincidence. Three years ago, David was a successful fashion photographer, but when life got challenging, he turned the camera on himself. This is his story. We're doing another run, and action, rolling. David has an external persona that is very larger than life. He's the life of the party and he's everyone's mate. Hey ladies, good morning. He goes through some extremes both in behaviour and, and emotions and that makes him generally very entertaining to be around. He's a perpetual optimist and a control freak. I'm David Morrell, I'm a photographer, I'm a director. Doing a little intro to camera. Dave's career was flourishing. He was living the dream as far as a photographer goes. He was based in Sydney but also travelled the world with his work. All my dreams were coming true. It was all happening, it was all paying off. And then it was just sort of like, bang, reality check. I picked up my, my phone and just started filming. And I decided like right there on the spot to start documenting my journey. The purpose of which was going to be to help other people with life's big challenges. Because I knew it was going to be the fight of my life. It just was like everything else he'd ever tackled in life. If he wanted it enough, and if he tried hard enough and was a perfectionist enough about doing it, then he'd, he'd get there. So hopefully we're going to see some family. Maybe they forgot me. Maybe I came all this way for nothing. I think the biggest surprise that took everyone was his dad working away in Norway, having a solution. I'm a scientist, you know, I don't believe in coincidence. And rather than sit as a normal family would have to and just wait for the worst to happen, I decided I would do something. There he is. Say good day. Good day. How are you, mate? Good. in Jakarta. I went up there to do some meetings with Harper's Bazaar and a few other clients and I fell very ill with dengue and my friend uh, took me to hospital. I'd had a couple of dizzy spells in Singapore. I thought oh, I should get a CT scan and just you know check everything's okay. <laughs> I could just read the subtleties of what was going on. I knew it was pretty obvious that it was something major. Yeah, well, you don't have to be a scientist. <laughs> you don't have to be a scientist to understand what's going on in these pictures. Okay, um, what's, wrong? what's wrong with this picture? I was just full of disbelief. I think I just so badly didn't want to believe it that I didn't believe it. It's quite shocking to think that something that large was inside someone's head and they were walking around and operating all this time. That's a brain tumour. Death was the first thing, to be honest, that crossed my mind and I thought, you know, we'll be counting down the time left with him straight away. <laughs> oh, I had this stunned numbness because I knew damn well how bad tumours can be. I asked my boss about it. He's professor of neurosurgery but he's also the leader of our lab and our lab is a cell biology lab which is part of the Oslo University Hospital. He said well do what you think, find out what you can, organise it call it work, which was very good of him. When David was born, we were living on a farm in the Hunter Valley. 
He came out kicking and he just always, always was very loving, but also very difficult, demanding. I taught David how to ride when he was about two. I mean, he could hardly walk, but he wanted to get on a horse. He's always been a daredevil. Taking risks would just give me a buzz and I would, you know, knock myself out I don't know how many times before I was 10 doing crazy things. We were just always outside on the farm playing and doing stuff with Dad. Dad's always bred Arabian horses, that's been his love. Come my little darlings. As a horse breeder I was wondering a lot about genetics and development. And so I decided when I was about 30 that I had to go to uni and learn all about it. Wayne and I separated in 1999 after being married for 27 years. He was working as a research scientist then. In 2007, he moved to Norway and got a position there as a research scientist and he's been there ever since. When Dave got the diagnosis in Jakarta, we sort of all sprang into action. I'd been living in Bali for a few months, so jumped on a plane down to Sydney and started shopping around for a neurosurgeon. So here we are at the okay. Prince of Wales and we're going inside. Hi, Charlie. Me too. I'm, um, I've sent you an email. I'm making a documentary about my treatment Fine, process. No Come um, in. Okay, so you do have a brain tumour. It's a big one. Uh, it's sitting in the right uh, parietal area, which is about here. But given the location of your tumour, there is a chance I could paralyse you with surgery. No, the thing was... I did not want to have surgery. And I was exploring options of treatment of not having surgery. And obviously I had a tumour, you know, the size of an orange. You can have this done publicly. Right. It won't cost you a cent. The trouble is you won't have me as your surgeon, that's a trouble. Uh, that's what I want, as yeah. you know, I've heard you're the man, but... Yeah, but you will have my fellow. My fellow is a fully qualified surgeon. He tried all the famous surgeons, but he only had Medicare, no money, so he wasn't going to get any famous surgeon, only their understudy. Feeling the weight. The gravity of it all, I guess. Um, my positivity, my impulses, my seeing things with such amazing clarity have taken a little beating today. <clears throat> and there's the lump there. At this stage, I'd seen someone having a brain tumour removed on the show called RPA. If I come in from above, I can actually find the ophthalmic and clip it. Dr Brenda Shiverlingham was the doctor on it, and she just gained my confidence. I first met David uh, around May of 2011 when he came to see me in my office. It's just been a lot to deal with it um, and get my head around even though my head is already technically around it. Uh. <laughs> Certainly David came with uh, some support networks and, and he was keen to film everything as well, which is a bit unusual for a consultation. So you would consider operating with me? Yeah. Definitely. Wow, that's yeah. great to hear. We just thought, wow, and that was in the public system. All primary brain tumours are graded from one through to four, and grade four tumours are highly aggressive malignant tumours. So given David's age and the overall appearance on the scan, I felt that we were dealing with a grade two or at, at the worst a grade three. The entrance to the RPA. A life-changing day. Big day. I'm gonna be fine. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. 
Um, yeah, I'm having an um, operation with Brenda Shivering today. On the day of surgery, I had a whole bunch of friends, some of whom had flown in um, from overseas. Aha! Uh -huh. How's the posse? How's this? Karen's come all the way from Singapore for this beautiful warm morning. Uh, it's about six degrees Celsius. <laughs> I'd gone down from Brisbane to be with him. Wayne flew in from Norway, and obviously Dave had flown in from Bali, so we sort of congregated there from all corners of the earth. Really, it might have been ten years since we'd all been together. Easy, <laughs> The only thing I was looking for was that he could speak and that he could move, really. I mean, anything else was going to, was swelling that was going to go down. Darling, they just went down to the camera. I was kind of really, you know, out of it and a bit of pain and, yeah, I think that was the only time I shied away from the camera. Dave made the most amazing recovery. Sort of less than 36 hours post-operatively, he came home and, I mean, he was fine. Big waves. Nice and tight. We hired a place at Bronte Beach and tried to have a nice week. Towards the end that I started to think, this has really gone on a little bit long, I wonder if the pathology is not going to be so great. We went in to, um, to see Brenda and I saw her uh, face and the expression on her face just kind of gave it away to me. Unfortunately the news is not good. The news has actually come back as a fool. Generally speaking, a grade 4 tumour carries with it a pretty dismal prognosis with an average survival of 14 months. You're in the best situation possible with a grade 4 yeah. to, to have, a, have that longer term survival. Okay? Yeah. And I'm not going to stop thinking that way. And I don't want you well, to. Well, we went and saw Brenda today. Yeah. Yeah. And the pathology turned out to be grade four, unfortunately. Uh, but um, I'm feeling all right, and we're gonna fight, fight on. And um... he was just being ridiculously positive. I remember almost being annoyed at him, thinking, "Don't be an idiot, mate. Don't you realise what this means?" You know, I spent a couple of days meditating and just getting it out of my head that the life expectancy is months. And I said, OK, that, that piece of information is completely useless to me. i got to get that out of my head because um, it serves no role other than to instill fear or frightening, and that's, and that's useless emotion. Can I communicate with you somehow? Yeah, yeah. Well, you've got my email address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we were told in Brenda's office, yes, we were pretty stunned, but Wayne had a plan in his head from um, before he flew from Norway. Dad was working with people indirectly that were involved in vaccine therapy for grade four glioblastoma. I guess um, fortuitously, or it ended up being the, the exact type of tumor that his um, department was working on. My boss, he said to me, if it's a glioblastoma grade four, I will treat him here in Oslo. 25%.
I hadn't really fully appreciated until then how much he was going to be able to help. He was working with a team in Norway who were already doing a research program on it for a vaccine for glioblastoma. So it was absolutely remarkable. Yes, I think we're definitely seeing an effect here. My reason for even going for the operation in the first place was to get some of the live tumour tissue so that I could grow the cells from it and hopefully isolate the cells that caused the tumour because these are what we would need to make a vaccine to. I was quite encouraging of uh, David going on that trial. The dendritic cell vaccine trials have been around for a little while now and there are several centres worldwide that have tried it. But having said that, it, it really needs to be stressed that it is a trial which therefore means that we don't know if it's going to work or not. It is Dave's only hope to live. It was the only way we could really have any hope. Wayne had to transport the tumour cells back to Norway in order to make the vaccine. They needed to remain at body temperature, so Wayne had them in pockets in his jacket on the plane so that they were close to his body to keep them alive. It was about three weeks from surgery till when I got to Norway. Hugo was on vacation from his veterinary studies. No, you can see me, bro. <laughs> that time was both strange and, and good, for want of a better word, because um, yeah, it was the first time Dave, Dad and I had been together for I don't know how long. This is Wayne in front of Wayne's Coffee. They did all of this when he moved to Oslo. How thoughtful. Dad and I have, you know, always had a pretty good relationship, but the bit of volatility, he's got a temper on him, and I'm pretty stubborn. I keep finding my towel on the floor. That, that tells me that David's here. <laughs> what towel? It's like having a, a kid back in the family. <laughs> a 35-year-old kid. I must be blue-blind, because yeah, I, saw, be. I saw blue and blue, and it looked pretty similar. <laughs> No, yours is slightly inferior guest towel, not as good as mine. I noticed that the thread count was a bit low. Here we are running a little late to get to leukophoresis. Papa Bear's a bit stressed. So the first five months I spent in Norway started with the leukophoresis, um, harvesting my immune cells. I'm about to stick a needle in my neck. My name is Ulf. I'm a radiologist. And I'm going to put in a catheter yep. in your jugular vein, vein yep. down to your heart, because they're going to harvest stem cells. We have all together included 22 patients here in Oslo in this first set of phase one, phase two studies. We have ongoing cancer vaccines uh, for prostate cancer, melanomas, for ovarian cancer. The aim of our lab is to make therapies and we have two main goals. One is to try and cure glioblastoma. The other is to do brain repair for people with damaged brains or with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Making the vaccine takes several weeks, so in that time they give the traditional radiation and chemotherapy in order to slow down the tumour stem cells. Oh, this is going to be my new haircut. Huh? Yeah. Wow. I think it wasn't until September that I started the actual vaccine shots, which was once a week. If you don't go into the interdermal layer, they will not migrate to the lymph nodes. Where is it? 
and the tumour was used to make a vaccine. So they've used the cells that were from his tumour to make antibodies against, which they give to David. And so his body is being reminded of what his tumour cells look like and it's using his immune system to actually go and kill those tumour cells if there are any there. If he gets red swellings around the sites of vaccination, that's a good sign. That means his body's doing something about the information it's just received. The other thing is, of course, they do an MRI each a couple of months to see if there's any tumour coming back or any new tumours. It was very hard not to start thinking about every possible scenario, including the, the bad scenarios, and I, I think Dave would be lying if he said he wasn't, that wasn't going through his mind. The very first MRI scan was a real nail-biter for all of us because we knew that glioblastomas can grow back in two weeks, let alone two months. And so that was extremely exciting news to get our first MRI scan that, to say that he, nothing had grown at all. There was no, no trace of the tumour. I have a farm that we own on the border of Sweden and Norway. Hello, beauties. David comes with us on the weekend when he's visiting and we work with the horses together. He's got more caution than he used to have, but yes, he's still pretty brave. I like Oslo. I probably like the farm a bit more. But I did spend uh, four or five months there pretty much by myself, and um, that was pretty tough. When I was at the farm was when I was having a big a sort of major depression, and um, it was a pretty, pretty tough time. And there's a little bit of, like, why, why me, why am I alive and not dead when everyone says you should be, and then to a complete opposite sort of range of emotions. He became more and more tired and stressed from the repeated travel back and forth to Norway. I realised that it's not just a physical thing we're fighting here. He really did need assistance with his mental health. I would like to have been able to just snap myself out of it and use the meditation and, and do it, but it was, um, it was kind of impossible that time. He needed a rest for a few months and remained on the farm in Sweden. And um, he recovered. <laughs> hey, horses. They're like it in Norway, far from Arabia. Dad said to me that he's rediscovered his son and they are really close and I don't think they'll ever lose that, that closeness now. But yes, they probably did let things slide for a few years. Good boy. There was a few clashes along the way, but um, generally pretty good and uh, probably never better than it is now. With all the time spent in Norway and with, with him, it's sort of get along or get out. <laughs> now he's being vaccinated and comes to visit every two months. So we good know each other much better now. It's been two and a half years since the surgery and uh, I, I was wondering where he was and what had happened to him. How are you? Good. Good so you. good to see you. Yeah. You know, it was extremely exciting uh, just to know that he was alive and well. He looked wonderful. He looked amazing. He looked a picture of health. Come on through. He has just continually had scan after scan of MRI after MRI where there's just been no tumour. Essentially he's still alive when the statistics say he shouldn't be, so it seems like the, the vaccine is working. It's very um, 
dangerous to uh, have too much conclusions on this phase one, phase two studies. But uh, we are very optimistic because we have never seen uh, such effects on, on, on these kind of patients earlier. In the glioblastoma world, um, it's still quite early in the trial phase. The dendritic cell vaccine, I think they're promising results uh, from various centres, but I, have, I think it's a long way off becoming a routine therapy. It's starting to hit us all, I think, including Dave, that Dave actually might be going to live and he needs a life back. I do feel at the moment like I'm, I'm in a bit of limbo. I'm sort of being forced by the universe to have exercise some patience and, um, and wait, you know, which is hard when you're an impatient person and you've just been through what I've been through. You, you know, I'm like, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Getting him into this trial, I believe, was a very good idea, the best option for him. And so far, everything is good. So I believe that I did, did good for him. Just always cross our fingers and every time we wait and wait to get the next MRI and almost think, wow, you know, when it's clear again, you know, of course it's clear, David's not going to get, get it back, but then we do still all worry before, you know. I'm David Morrell, I'm not a statistic, I'm, I'm my own person and I can create my own story and it doesn't have to be one of gloom and doom. Even if it is one in a million that come through alive, why can't that be me? First day I've been late for my radiotherapy by 15 minutes. From today, because I was late, I had to wait and wait for my chemotherapy tablet. And so I was forced to sit there and listen to this guy who's a porter or an orderly playing the most beautiful music. Join a discussion with David Morell and the team behind the program now at hashtag Australian Story.